Who start? Yeah. Okay. So it's four it's four p.m. Can I ask everyone to mute their microphones? Officers and guests, could you also turn off your cameras? You should turn on your camera and microphone when you speak, but please turn them back on again afterwards. All councillors must ensure that the cameras remain on and um, Democratic Service have started recording. Good afternoon, welcome to the Social Services Scrutiny Committee on Tuesday the 29th of November 2022. Please note that this meeting has been recorded and may be broadcast via the authorities internet site. The images and sound recording may also be used for training purposes within the authority. Apologies for absence. Thank you. Item number two, declarations of interest. And just a reminder, um, just to ask all members and officers if they have an interest to declare. Any? OK, agenda item three, forward work programme. Um, so we've set out the, the scrutiny forward work program and like as as we've said previously it's important to note that this is a live document and is flexible and it can change based on the development of the cabinet work uh, forward work program or any other urgent issues for discussion that are raised so at the moment we're running a version four of the work program some items have been moved around and added and again this highlights that this is a live and flexible document um, we'll be updating this document um, for changes in January because the expansion of the flying start um, will be added again um, next year. Um, and also, I just want to remind members that if there are any items that they feel they wanted to add to the work programme, please bring these forward. Have we got any questions on the forward work programme? Any comments on the forward work programme? OK, that's fine. So we proceed to the next item. So the next item, item four, is the children's service strategy and to consider the report. And it's on pages 15 to 22. And cabinet member Julia Jenkins is going to take us through um, an introduction of the report. And then Taryn will take us through the details of the report. Thanks. Can you hear me? OK, this report provides scrutiny committee with information regarding the development and progress made within the children's services strategy, success, stability, stability and transition action plan. Success, stability and transition is one of the six key building blocks of success within the children's services strategy. Point 3.3 point three highlights further context on the six building blocks of success within the children's service strategy. Children's services strategy, current strategy, spans March 2020 to March 2023. The action plans that sit under each building block to success are updated annually to ensure there are clear annual steps to meet the strategy's ambition. Children's Services are currently working with key partners to revise the strategy for April 2023 to March 2028. It is planned that the key elements of the strategy will have annual action plans. The report shared with committee members provides an overview of the legislative context for our work, where we previously were, where we are now and our future ambition for our young people. We developed our support and change team in 2019 and the report illustrates how since this time we have delivered on our ambition to safely reduce the number of looked after children. However, there are and will be times we need to accommodate a child when we cannot safely support them at home. The report also highlights the cha key challenges that we strive to overcome to meet the placement and accommodation to meet of our young people. And the recommendations a uh, scrutiny committee is asked to receive this report and to raise questions and challenge leading to improvement. Our success and stability and transition action plan is a services key plan to support those who are care experienced. I'll hand over to Taryn to provide further details with regards to where we are now. Thank you, Chair. Jenkins. Whilst this report primarily explores our success, stability and transition action plan, it is essential to highlight that all action plans that sit under the children's services strategy are coherently dovetailed. 
Corporate Painting Board received the progress report on the Success, Stability and Transition Action Plan to monitor its progress and act as a critical friend. For the course of 2022-2023, the Corporate Parenting Board has reviewed its terms of reference, further embedded a highlight structure for all agencies and has developed an induction process for new Corporate Parenting Board members. There are currently plans in place for young people to rename the local authorities Corporate Parenting Board and the Corporate Parenting Board is co-chaired between the Children and Young People's Champion and a Care Experienced Young Person. Through the work undertaken with families and partner agencies, there's been a yearly decrease in the become looked after rates of children and young people within the local authority. The report highlights to us that placement sufficiency consider, continues to be a considerable pressure for the local authority and shares that we've developed a closer to home steering group that will oversee the developments of the local residential care provisions we intend to develop further supported accommodation developments for those who are care experienced and help drive our local recruitment and retention plans under Foster Wales. Working relationships with housing continue to be a considerable strength and we've recently worked alongside housing for a redevelopment at the Neighbourhood Learning Centre which will provide five supported accommodation flats for care experienced young people who are engaged in an education. Young people leaving care having every opportunity to positively fulfil their ambition and reach their personal goals in life is a key area of delivery for the action plan. And you'll note within the report an overview provided on the pathway to work and the recently developed Serend model, which has been undertaken with EE. The report, as we move down at point seven, highlights key next steps that are included in our action plans, but as we've said, they are under annual review. Karen, um, do we have any questions? Councillor Clyde Tubby. The children that are looked after, how many, what percentage of say 20 year olds are unemployed? Uh, do most of these young people get jobs by the time they're 20 or, or no? So I was only thinking like that the, the maybe five living in the neighbourhood learning centre, but if they only mix with similar people, it's nice, you know, if they've got other outlets. And I was just wondering, I know it says you supported 44 <coughs> young people into jobs, but how many are unemployed about, do, do you think? So in terms of this specific percentage breakdown against age, we can of course provide that in any future reports. I think what is important to highlight is two to three years ago, we acknowledged that actually our care experienced young people need a different kind of support and mentoring to access work and employment. Equally, they didn't have the same opportunities as other young people to join a family business or engage with a parent and join them in their profession, which is why we really developed the pathway to work. So there's currently four care experienced young people who are undergoing traineeships within the local authority. And equally, as you'll see from the information shared within the report there are a number of young people being supported when we compare that to what our ambition was at the start of pathway to work we've really exceeded that and when you consider that against a very small staffing team of one support worker and our um, children's looked after team as well there's been considerable success but I think there continues to be a journey to go but in terms of those specific data we would happily provide that at future scrutiny. Uh, uh I was wondering as well, I know a few years ago there was a terrible shortage of social workers. Uh, what's it like at the moment today? Are you more or less fully staffed? for? Because at one time they, quite a few came from Bulgaria, I think it was. But are you more or less fully staffed now for social workers? So nationally, there continues to be difficulties in terms of recruiting qualified social workers. Merthyr has really bucked that trend in many um, ways. We have developed something that's called Passion for Practice in Merthyr, where practitioners help lead service change. And what practitioners tell us is that that makes them feel supported, included and part of the service so that we have far higher retention rates than we have prior to having Passion for Practice in place. Currently, there's the equivocal of two full-time social work vacancies across the service. 
on average over the last two to three years we have carried two full-time vacancies however that rate is lower than pre-pandemic levels which is due to lots of the work that's been undertaken in the service around staff well-being and inclusion oh thanks thanks for that Aaron. um i've got a question if, if that's okay um out of the 176 children looked after by the local authority how many of those are placed out of area or are they all placed in Merthyr, please? So Merthyr is a very small local authority, which actually means that as placing within the borough can be really complex for, for us as a, a department. What I would say is we've seen an increase over the last three to four years of the number of young people who have been placed within county, thanks to some work by our fostering team. However, we do have a high percentage of young people placed outside local authority. What we do is that we map that internally and then for those young people who are placed in a local authority that neighbours Mursa on our boundaries, once again, more than happy to provide that data and a breakdown for further scrutiny. Yes, please. And part of that, th those placements, um, are, are some of those like bed and breakfast, are they like unregulated or? So the local authority currently has no um, placements that are operating without regulation. Okay, lovely, thank you. Um, next, we've got Councillor Ian Thomas. Darren, and uh, towards the end of the report, um, what we need to do next, one of the points is expand through co-chairing agreements. Uh, could you explain how that works, please? And um, what good is doing? So our corporate parenting board has previously been chaired by the Ch children and young people's champion. What we want to do is, is that we want that to be co-chaired with the young person and that young person to be linked in with other young people. So their voice is very strong as part of our corporate parenting board. We've developed a participation plan that that young person who co-chairs will help lead and take forward. And that means that as part of corporate parenting board, then any reports that go, they will have young persons scrutiny and feedback at that point. So what we want to make sure is that we're not making decisions for our young people, but with them. Thank you. Next, we have Councillor Declan Salmon. Thank you, Chair. Taryn, at 3.1, it says when a child or young person becomes looked after, the local authority has a responsibility to ensure that children that looked after children and young people experience the highest quality of care, opportunity and achieve outcomes. Um, now, in regards to uh, children that come from out of borough into Merthyr Tidville, what, resp what responsibility do the local authority have for those young people or children? and the wider local local community um, because concerns have been raised regarding um, a premises um, in 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 Merthyr Tidville um, about the um, about the the, the behaviour um, of young people in those premises and we don't seem to be getting any answers and to be honest residents are I won't say frightened but they, they're just concerned what is important to say is, is that there can be some stigma occasionally around children who are care experienced. What I would say is that these are young people who have suffered significant adverse experiences and are struggling at times with that adversity, which translates to some behaviours that are seen by members of the public. In respect of the local authorities' duty to children who are not Merthyr young people but are accommodated by other local, uh, local authorities and placed in the borough, so our duties translate to their education and supporting their educational attainment. Our duties also translate to if there are safeguarding concerns, then those would pre uh, present at our multi-agency safeguarding hub. What I would say in terms of the local authorities' ability to influence those provisions, they are private care providers and that really does impact the amount that we are able to do. They are regulated and any concerns in terms of that regulation and those meeting the, them meeting those requirements, we report as a standard as a local authority. We will also frequently contact our counterparts in other local authorities to share any residents' concerns that are raised because those concerns relate to their young people and they need to know what that provision looks like. From a planning perspective, 
they would have to meet planning requirements. However, in terms of change of use of some premises, planning is not required for some children's provision, and therefore the local authority has very limited influence about some of the positionings of those provisions. What I will say is from a Mercer Children's Services perspective is that residential care is required by young people and that can be a suitable model of care where children can be kept safe, but it is about the implementation and quality of those provisions. Yeah, thank you, Taryn. Taryn, um, it wasn't really answered, to be honest. I, I know you said stigma attached to it, but when residents see the, the windows of a, of a premises being smashed up, uh, damaged onto a property, ambulance turning up, you know, there are concerns. Um, and you mentioned about concerns are raised then at the multi MASH, multi-authority multi safeguarding hub. But concerns have been raised, but nothing has come back from that. You know, it, it's as if the concerns of residents are not being addressed. I'm, I'm just wondering going forward, maybe um, maybe if uh, residents could, could be reassured, basically. And I think the local authorities' ability to have power and control over those provisions, if they were local authority residential placements, would be greater, given that they are not regulated by the local authority or run. That can create some complication, I suppose, around the influence that we have around those provisions. They are open to regulators, and it is for regulators then with those concerns to go in and see whether they are meeting the standards of care that they should. So I would encourage anybody with concerns, and I know, Councillor, that you've previously brought some of those matters to my attention to raise them with the relevant parties so that they can go to the regulators for their consideration. OK, and with those concerns, will the regulators come back? Because we haven't heard anything yet. So it's my understanding that they generally wouldn't provide detailed feedback, but what then happens is underneath our four C's agreement, if any regulators is put into special requirements where they have enhanced monitoring, then the local authority are notified. And can you assure residents that um, every everything is okay and um, they're, just, they're just looking for assurance, reassurance? I suppose in the interest of transparency, I feel that that's beyond the gift of children's services to be able to offer reassurance to residents because we do not run the provisions and we do not have any responsibility for regulating them. So even if we share your concerns, we can report them, but we have no influence around then what regulators do next around those provisions. It's quite frightening, to be honest. Um, OK, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Aaron, um, I've got a few more questions, if that's OK. Um, in relation to 5.10, about the partnership with EE, that really good partnership, like, is that time bound or is that, you know, is there a plan for that? Currently, that's not time limited. It was fully at a pilot and now we're looking at wider rollout. What I would say is, is that the outcomes of that have been encouraging to the degree that we are now looking at wider rollout. So we've spoken with education about there being some pilot schools, the pilot not being limited to care experienced young people, but being open to wider young people within the community. Lovely. Thank you. Councillor Claire Jones. Um, Taryn, I'm just going to go on from Louise's question earlier on because out of the child looked after, how many are actually in local foster placement? Because this is something perhaps you can bring again to the to, to us further. Um, local foster placement, out of area foster placement, out of area residential, um, how many are in a kinship setting and have we got any in out of area secure? So I'm just wondering if that could be brought forward as well at some point, please. <coughs> Yeah, more than happy to bring that forward. In terms of just giving some of that information now, we currently have 35 young people who are within local authority foster care provision. We have 42 young people who are within kinship care provision. Okay, and we have 13 young people who are in residential and four of them have a plan to step out to residential setting within the next six months. Oh, thank you so much. Um, another thing I have, let me scroll down, I do apologise. You mentioned the accommodation that has five individuals, you, that there's going to accommodate five individuals. Um, what support is given? So with the staffing level, are the positions already filled? Um, also then, do monthly monitoring, will monthly monitoring attend there every month? And then obviously you'll have the annual CIW inspection, that comes into that as well. Because it's a 16 plus provision 
um, and it is about supported accommodation. Yeah. Again, it doesn't fall under the same regulation requirements as fostering. What I would say is in terms of the site that has been developed, there will be 24 hour on site support. Mercer has been very fortunate over the last three to four years that we've really developed our 16 plus provision and that's given us a range of provision with a different range of needs being placed within those provisions. The one that will be on the previous NLC site will be key experienced young people who are actively in training or looking for employment. So it will be the lower end of our support needs for 16 plus provision. Oh, lovely. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I was just going to say, what is it? You 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 mentioned intensive packages. That's five point nine. What is what is included in an intensive package? So those intensive packages are under our pathway to work. So young people are given an individual mentor when they start any play employment or training that sits outside of their employment to be able to support them. We also support them with funding any relevant provisions such as CSC cards, any work materials that they may need. But that monitoring has been really, really key to success for a number of our young people. OK, um, on that note, after that one, I was going to say well done, but I, I have got one final um, 7.2. You've got the, the, the key next stages. Um, I have part of the key stage, as you said, the many of our care experienced young people have support from the mental health services. Um, can the mental health services provide the adequate support? Because at present, I know we are having issues with, with CAMS and, and adult services. So gaining timely accessible mental health support for our CLAR population has always been a difficulty for the local authority and one that we are seeking to resolve alongside the health board. We have recently, in partnership with Bridge End and RCT, developed something that's called MAPS. And what we've done is, is that we've commissioned an organisation who has a specialist team of therapists for care experienced young people. And the local authority have units to use so that we can gain tailored, bespoke, timely intervention for our care experienced young people and, and those who are in care. That supports both the foster carer, the young person and the school and it's bred some real success in the last nine months. And we've had confirmation last week that that will continue for a further 12 month pilot. But we continue to make sure the health board is very well appraised around that work so that we can have a model of working together going forward. That's lovely. Thank you so much for your answers. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor, Ga Councillor Gath Richard. Thank you. Um, it's a follow up from what the chair and vice chair um, asked really regarding placements and out of county placements, etc. Um, because obviously the um, strategy on the page, one of the points are that um, looked after children is supported with, either within the family or as close as home to possible as possible. Um, so am I correct in thinking that the um, bullet point four in four one that the um, placement support service is going to tender? Have I missed the point there, or is that to address um, provision which could have been previously out of the area? Dreadfully sorry, so just to make sure that, that I'm with you on the point that you are. Did you say that was 4.1? Yeah, 4.1, bullet point four. Okay. In the regional um, ICF funded multi-agency placement support services for yeah. the tender. So the multi-agency placement support services tender is the provision for young people's mental health that I, I just made reference to. Yeah. Um, and that had been delayed for a little while um, yeah. regionally whilst we had agreement about that model moving forward. But as I've shared, it's been in place now for about nine months. Um, I think in another paragraph, 4.4, um, um, Welsh Government has, um, funding has been secured for a feasibility study on the development of a residential care provision. Now that would address the bringing I looked after to take me right to home. Yeah, agreeably so. So the local authority have put forward to Welsh Government a number of proposals for developing in-house residential provision. Yeah. 
we feel really confident that that will support good outcomes for our young people um, and will support us with financial efficiency. Equally, we feel that that will address some of the concerns that Councillor Salmon has shared about young people being within residential provision in Merthyr and us having more control around the yeah. staffing and facilitation of those provisions to keep our young people and the community safe. That's right, yeah. And I appreciate where... Am I on or not? Where Councillor Salmon is coming from because you and I have had conversations about other issues in my area as well, really. But... It is difficult, as you explained to, to Declan, that you we have very little control over those private providers in our areas. Um, am I correct in thinking as well there was going to be a more regional collaboration as well? So there's a number of factors currently being looked at. So what we I've strove really hard to understand is the level of need in Merth and what residential provision needs to look like for us moving forward. What we know is even if we have sufficiency in terms of the number of beds, matching young people within suitable provision is incredibly important. So we may not be able to match young people alongside each other in Merthyr. What we are doing is working alongside RCT and Bridge End to make sure that regionally we have sufficient provision so that we can support each other with placements. So where we're unable to place in our local authority, they remain within the regional footprint. Yeah. We're also looking to work on one regional development together, which would be for our most complex young people that we would then run as a region as well. Yeah. I've got another couple of questions, Chair, if that's OK. Um, it's regarding the new provision at the Gurnos, really. Um, it sounds very exciting. And I was wondering if there's any possibility we could have a view in before it opens. making sure my mic is on. Yeah, we can more certainly look at uh, taking that forward. It is very exciting. I think it's really impressive for people to see. And I think we often speak about provisions within scrutiny, but seeing it really does make it come to life. And it's very impressive, the environment our young people will be living in. Yeah. And my final one is a comment, perhaps not a question, really. It's good to see that the number of looked after children are on a downward or have been on a downward slope because Certainly, since I was elected, um, it was moving in the other direction for a, a number of years, but it's good to see that there is a, a reduction in the number of looked after children. And obviously, the intervention at an early stage appears to be working. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Richards. Um, any other questions? No, um, and just a, a last one for me in relation to um, the mental health. I know Claire's asked. Um, so there is assurance because my worry is um, if there was if there's delay in accessing young people services and then while they're waiting, they now become an adult. So do they start that process again? Do, do you know what I mean? And accessing a different service. So there is that assurance there's, they, they, that, these, that these children are being seen. So in terms of the provision, as I, I've shared the MAPS panel, that's in place. But in the report, we also document about or, or in the later report that we reviewed today as part of scrutiny about our transition panel. Mm. So every young person who we anticipate within children's services will need a package of support when they turn into adulthood. Uh, heard at that panel, there's a joint assessment between children's services and adult services to make sure that there's continuity and consistency in okay. that support. Okay, great. I'm either when Gareth's asked because I was going to ask about a visit, so there we go. Um, any comments, please? Do the um, OTs very informative, really? So if that's yeah. what I was perhaps suggesting. Yeah, it's a good suggestion. Um, just a comment for me, really. I think is evidence really good um, working with young people and listening to those voices, those care, who've, who've experienced care. I think it does evidence it through this. Um, and I think the fact, you know, the, the you know the the housing in the Gurness, you know, is potentially shortlisted for awards and then I would imagine long term they're perhaps benchmarked for other services. I just think it's really positive and I just wanted to comment on that. Um, yeah, and it's good to have an achievement to be celebrated as well. So thank you. Any other comments? Oh, Councillor Declan Salmon. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just quickly, just like to echo uh, Councillor Gareth Richards' comments uh, to Taryn and her team, uh, you know, for the work they've done over the last few years, you know, bringing the numbers of, looked, of children looked after down. Um, absolutely fantastic. Um, I just hope you hope you keep it up. 
Thank you, Chair. Any other comments? Okay, so we'll end item four. four. Yes. Council not tempting fate, but with social services, you don't know what's from the corner. Yeah. <laughs> Councillor Clegg, yeah, have you? Sorry. Yeah. I remember once someone moved you with 13 children that had to be put into care at the same time. This would be about 15 years ago now, so we shouldn't talk too soon, really. <laughs> OK, so are we all happy to move forward and we all happy that we've received the report and we've, you know, raised um, questions and, and um, hopefully leading to improvement. But anything else you wanted to add? No, lovely. Right. Next item is item number five, which is the yearly years and flying staff report on pages 23 to 30. Um, I'll hand you over to Cabinet member Julia Jenkins. Thanks, Chair. Um, this is a report by Chris Hall and Sarah Alster. Um, it's the Early Years and Flying Start update. Uh, the summary report. This report has been requested by the Scrutiny Committee. The report sets out the 2021-2022 performance data for the Flying Start programme, both from nationally collected data and locally implemented systems. The report ex explored some of the changes facing the Flying Start programme including future expansion and the current commissioning model for childcare, which is an area that the service identifies that is now, now has to resolve given the expansion of flying start as it builds toward the full offer of funded part-time childcare for all two to three year olds. And the recommendation, Scrutiny Committee is asked to receive this report and to raise questions and challenge, challenge leading to improvement. Thank you, Chair. Are you okay to take us through? Um, yeah, I can um, take you through the report. I think the the, um, the obviously the context of the report is that Flying Start is due to expand as a as a program, but it will only expand in relation to offering childcare as from April twenty three. So the uh, participants entering the program won't have the full offer of parent in early language development. Um, and health visiting, it will just be the childcare offer. So in terms of where we were as a, a local authority, we had a, a, a cap figure of 1,204. That cap figure is now 1,287 because we brought in the Park 3 lower super output area in September. Um, and that was a report that went to Cabinet. Um, key elements then from a previous report, which would have gone to the Education Scrutiny Committee at the time, you can see there in the table under 4.1, shows you the areas that have been completed in terms of the, the taking forward of the programme. Um, and then under 4.2 really lists all of the current Flying Start LSOAs that are within the programme, which is obviously a 16 now out of the full 36 LSOAs. So there's still 20 lower super out of areas which are not part of the, the current programme. So in terms of performance data, which was one of the focuses of this report, uh, colleagues might be aware that every year we take a performance report, or we have done a performance report into Cabinet, which looks at the national data and flying start and allows some benchmarking and comparison to other local authority areas. However, that report um, by Welsh Government has not been produced for the last two years, and we're still waiting for it to be produced for the 21-22 year, if it gets produced. So we, we're still waiting for that. Um, it, what the, the data shows you is that the pandemic has had quite an impact in terms of people, children's attendance within childcare and actually taking up childcare. We've seen that drop off during the pandemic, even though childcare was open. Obviously, there was lots of disruption in terms of both attendance and parents feeling vulnerable in terms of opening up children to being in those settings. So the, the take up of Fly and Start was impacted significantly during those years. Um, those two year period and still continues to have to be rebuilt. We have to build back that confidence in parents in order to get that childcare taken up. We always think of flying starters, the childcare being the one element that they all really want, um, but we've still got some job to do to build back where we were prior to prior to the pandemic. Um, in terms of that, um, taking you through really in terms of page 26, the top of that, we use something locally called the Foundation Phase Profile Compact 
which is an assessment of children's development against critical areas. And that data analysis show, gives you a comparison of where we were in 2018-19 in terms of children entering provision and then children exiting provision um, in comparison to where we are now in 21-22. And you can see that some of those are still way well behind where we were back in 2018-19. With children entering provision, with their development severely impacted by the COVID pandemic. Overall, the data analysis would show you that actually children are making slightly better progress in some areas and not in others. So, you know, there's some value added that's been made up. Um, but when you look at their ongoing journey into education, they are going to start, they're going to leave provision further behind than where they were pre-pandemic um, in terms of comparison to the cohorts that came in at that time. This will be the last year we will present this data in this way because of the changes affecting education around how they utilize data. We'll have the same issues here in terms of the foundation phase profile. We will continue to use it to assess children's progress, but we will probably bring data which will talk about the value added for young people and that progress rather than the, the percentage that achieve that expected level of development in the, those core areas because it's being impacted in the same way as all the other curriculum reforms within within education. Um, in terms of then moving on into to 6.0, the fine start expansion, um, we're looking ahead. We've already been or told by Welsh Government now that we will have another 88 children that have to be brought into the programme from April. But as I mentioned, it'll only be for childcare. And that comes with a different problem because rather than taking in a cohort of not to four year olds and knowing how many live in the area, we now have to work out those that will come in at different points for childcare and leave at different points because of their intake into education. So we might well, it might look like that there's a lot more LSOAs we can bring in, but you're only looking at a certain age group of children, that two and a half to three and a half, tied up with when they can access education uh, in school. Um, so we're currently working through that and our intention is to bring a report to scrutiny in January in order for you to be able to analyse the the, the um, rationale for how we've come to those LSOAs um, and then for that to go to Cabinet, etc. for for approval. Um, so then the, the, the under 7.0, the one key area that we, we know we have to address, particularly with the expansion of full childcare for all two to three year olds, is the child care commissioning model. We brought a model in some, ooh, I want to say 10 or 12 years ago, which allowed us to influence the market and raise the quality of all providers across the council area um, by asking everybody if they wanted to deliver flying start, they then had to implement the systems and processes flying start would, op, would require and to meet the quality standards of flying start. Um, and that's worked well over the years, um, but what that has then enabled to, to happen is for parents to be able to have more choice over where they place their children and therefore we've got some unfilled spaces that we would have been paying for so in order to get better value we need to move more towards the approved provider model which would be you know paying for the exact amount of spaces that we want in each individual provision across the council area what that does do is it means less security for individual providers. So previously we might have funded 24 full places in an original setting. Whether those places are taken up or not, you'd still get the money for them. If we were commissioning 40%, you'd get the money for 40%. But moving to the approved provider model, you would only get those for the number of children we specifically allocate to your setting. So it doesn't give us much security for the childcare providers. And that obviously we have to balance up with their sustainability as individual organisations. Um, we know from the discussions we've had already with providers, there is um, a small number that would resist moving down that model. But we think in order for to get to the position when we have full childcare for all two to three year olds, it is a model that has to be addressed because at the moment we have to calculate payments for providers based upon three different models. Um, so we have to get to a uniform system for everybody. Um, it's going to be a challenge. It's not going to be welcomed by one or two providers, but it is something we need to do. Um, so that brings us on to the, to the where we want to be. Obviously, we want to be ready to expand the programme um, in line with the Welsh Government timescales. It does present some challenges because childcare provisions are meant to be within a 15-minute walk for the families. 
uh, pram pushing distance is what it's called by Welsh Government. So that will be challenging in some cases, might mean looking at uh, development of new sites, new childcare, and that means needing new childcare providers and potentially needing to have childcare qualified staff, which is a big concern for us at the moment in terms of the numbers uh, of childcare staff available with the right qualifications. Um, again, the, the, the cap figure will be expanded um, and uh, we need to look at how we obviously continue to improve those outcomes for children. I've listed the what we need to do next um, within within 7.0. I'm not going to go through those in in huge detail because we've covered them in the discussion uh, in the in the going through the report. Um, but we need to make sure all those are put into place to get the best value out of the program that we can. Happy to take any questions. Myself and Sarah Rossler, co-author of the report, are here. We'll we can take any questions possible. Thanks, for that, Chris. Uh, first, we have Councillor Clyde Tevy. Yes, I noticed in section seven. Point three. It says the local authority would prefer not to be a provider, but why is that? If you've got three places operating, uh, are they the current local authority providers? Are they being run successfully? Why, you know, why were they looking for private companies to take over? Yeah, I'll, I'll pick that one up. I've, the the um... Uh, Councillor Tevi, we've um, historically we we ended up taking those over because there were no other providers in the area, and literally it puts the authority in competition with private businesses throughout the community. So we would much prefer to actually have those private businesses develop, and the provisions are significantly more expensive in the local authority than if they were put out within the community provisions. Um, Partly because of the pay rates within the local authority, we have a, the, the pay scales, the job evaluation process sets what those staff should be earning, and that differs from what is in the community. We have we have tested the market previously um, twice, maybe yeah. twice, and you know we would be looking to test the market again because we've recently seen some success with bringing another provider into the area for childcare. Um, so you know, for us, the better model um, is to actually have those as providers as independent community businesses. So for flying start, if I, if I could ask as well, if a new provider comes in, how many do they normally, uh, how many children do they normally look after? I might get mine to go on. Um, yeah, so it will very much depend. So because they're regulated with the care inspectorate for Wales, the amount of children that they're allowed to have will depend on the floor space that they've got available and um, because there's a square meterage per child um, and also things like the number of toilets and the number of staff that they've got for that provision. So it really will depend. But I think, um, you know, the, lo the smallest provisions that we would see would be 12. Um, and they would go up to um, the provision in the Gurnos is 26 in the morning and 26 in the afternoon. So it really does vary depending on those elements. So I can quite understand why people don't want to take over a business and two people across. Uh, I can, you know, if I wanted a business, I can understand if it's a shop or something like that, you take the people. But these are quite little bit different in a way really but anyway so i can understand your difficulties in getting people because some of these council workers may have been working there for years uh, or working for the council for years and if you take on all their responsibility it it is a big decision to make really anyway thanks thanks very much Councillor Claire jones <clears throat> thank you um have we got enough health visitors? Because many parents are not seeing health visitors. Health visitor, the the, the staff, a health visitor may finish um, with COVID. I know my granddaughter hasn't seen a health visitor for a year. And I think they're on the fourth health visitor and yet to see them face to face. So I'm just wondering how have we have we got enough health visitors, please? Yeah. <clears throat> um, in in terms of health visitors, uh, for the for the flying star program, yes, we do have uh, the ratio that is required by Welsh government, which is one hundred and ten to one, 
but throughout COVID, all face-to-face -face engagement by, by health visitors was suspended, not just for fine staff, but for the whole of the genetic service. Everything moved to phone calls or, or online. Um, and um, what is being seen nationally is a shortage of health visitors. Um, we're currently in discussions with health because even as part of the Flying Start expansion now in April, there will be no additional resources for health, um, which is a significant issue for us because health have always been our entry in terms of the sign up to the programme and to the sign up into childcare. So that's why we're needing to look at different systems that will support the whole programme going forward. Um, but there's a skills mix discussion happening now on the table, which would be health visitors holding overall control, but having people with a range of skill sets actually delivering the work that health visitors may have previously delivered. Um, but we've also been impacted in Merthyr um, um, by some long term sick leave by members of uh, the health visiting teams, which they haven't automatically been able to replace. And we, we recruited to the Park 3 LSOA, and we were quite surprised. I say we recruited, but the health recruited for the Park 3 LSOA. We were quite surprised at the number of applications that we were able to appoint a health visitor for that area, but then that's been impacted by some sickness. Um, so I think it is a difficult one because I would say to you, if you were to put Fly and Start out across all of the local authority tomorrow, no, there wouldn't be enough health visitors. Health visitors are challenged. As I say, it's 110 cases to one. If you're a health visitor in Flying Start, if you're not in Flying Start, it could be 250, 300. Um, you know, there is no automatic limit, but the health do a, an assessment looking at the needs of the individual case in terms of whether they are universal and therefore need very light touch, whether it's an enhanced case and need a little bit more, or whether it's an intensive case and therefore needs quite a significant intervention and work with, with the family. So they do a needs basis as well, looking at it. Um, so, but there is a national shortage of health visitors. What you've just said now, do you find that, Karen, the services, if, if we haven't got enough health visitors, I mean, do you find that there are some children who are slipping under the radar that may need intervention or, or not? It is about multi-agency working and if we find that there are any capacity demands that we think that issues are not being picked up about us having really good working relationships with health colleagues. I know as part of our service development and planning, Children's Services and Flying Start have recently visited some other provisions in other localities to see how we can work more robustly together. But I, I think it's about having those honest and open relationships with other departments about when there are concerns around capacity and that impacting children being identified early enough so that they have preventative support about us looking how we work together to overcome that. Um, I've got another question, please. Seven on seven point one, you've got um Contentious challenges facing the flying start. And I was just wondering how you are dealing with the challenges facing flying start and and how it commissioners childcare in the future. Uh, in terms of the, the, the contentious challenge, I think we're having ongoing dialogue with um, a provider that's currently funded under the original model, which would be they would be fully funded for 24 places. We're trying to talk to them about the benefits of having a mixed economy approach, which means that they could open up not just to fly and start children, but to private paying uh, customers. Um, and that has been a key focus for the model we developed over the years because it brings a, a sustainability that should fly and start ever get pulled by Welsh Government. We don't think it will, but if, if it would, um, it gives them a better sustainability. It also gives a a mixture, more of a mixture to the children attending the setting so that, you know, you've you a social modelling approach, if you like, where children from diverse ranges of backgrounds, not just from deprived backgrounds, come together to learn. Um, but we know we've got a challenge with that one provider who will not want to move to this new model. Um, other than that, we, the, the, others, uh, the other models have actually, uh, the other providers that were in the original, um, have uh, over time been recommissioned out and re-tendered, <laughs> which is um, in relation to some of the work that was done um, mentioned in the to the last scrutiny committee in education, where we had to 
uh, retendered a prov provision, and that was a new provider that came into Merthyr, so they accepted the new way of, of the funding. And I think the other part of that, the contentious part, is because we're also a deliverer of services in terms of childcare, the community provider will say, well, hang on, you're going to fully pay yourself to do it. You're not going to give yourself less money and then someone else in the local authority pick up the tab. So there's going to be an ongoing debate and discussion, but we do need to address it overall, um, which again is part of the reason why as well we wouldn't want to be a provider. Both for your reports, it's really appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Ian Thomas. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> with regard to the operating models for childcare, um, if we go continue down the route of um, only paying for the places that we use and also insist that. Um, the providers meet our standards, and also that there's going to be a large expansion of two to three year olds to be catered for. Will there be enough providers? So, in line with the expansion program, there's um, lots of work going on behind the scenes at the moment to look at our childcare market, look at the number of places we've got available at the moment, and take up of those places. Um, and also in line with our population projections around the um, places that we'll need going forward. So in, a, in answer to your question, no, there will not be enough places at the moment because we've got some areas in Merthyr where we've got gaps in provision, um, where we know that we will need to develop new provision. Um, and the Welsh Government have um, announced a capital programme alongside the expansion programme, which will allow us to physically develop new spaces um, so that we can create new childcare provisions. So, um, so it'll be a combination. It'll be a combination of using existing providers um, as part of the ex expansion programme, but also developing new. Thank you. Any other questions? Chris, I just want to ask about areas. Next phase, what can you foresee as like one of the main, or as it's probably maybe more than one, what, what are the main barriers, please? When you mean barriers, you mean the uh, in terms of the the phased expansion of Flanstad? Yeah, um, I think one of the barriers oh, there, there are a number of issues wrapped up with the expansion. Um, as I said, the 88 are going to come in just for childcare, um, which means there's going to be an inequitable service to to, to parents. Um, whilst everybody would say, "Yep, yeah, we want to have the Flanstad childcare." If we identify needs within that family, there's going to be no resources to meet the other needs, and it's. We have a significant number of young people in Flying Star at the moment who uh, need enhanced support. They need access to educational psychology support. Um, and those resources are not going to be funded as part of the programme. Um, you know, if they are additional learning needs children, we're going to be going to education and having a discussion with the demands that's going to place on education because of the statutory uh, ALN bill. Um, I think then there are there are some other other ones I've mentioned in terms of the barriers about we have systems in place at the moment which um, enable us to manage the forty percent of the population that sign up to fly and start um, when those health visitor requirements are not there um, and we have to look at a different model then of actually parents signing up to fly and start and we have to look at a different model particularly for admissions arrangements into childcare. And we're currently working with education around the capita database and an online citizens portal admissions process, which will um, we have some online admissions at, at the moment, but we're looking at how that can be further enhanced. Because dependent upon the take up of childcare, dependent then upon the attendance of the children at childcare is how we work out and calculate how much each individual setting should be paid. Also in relation to what type of setting they are, are they an original accord or approved? So that calculation of a bill is reliant upon a huge amount of data going through it. So we've got to address that in preparation sooner rather than later um, in order to make that right. Um, in, in Well, I say right, there's nothing wrong with it now, but it would not stand up if we then suddenly went, here's 100% of children going through childcare. So we've got to smarten those systems up and, and computerise them far more to make it manageable because we don't envisage any admin, extra admin money coming into the programme. Um, for that to happen. Um, we don't know the expansion into phase three. We haven't got a timescale for that at the present. Um, 
you know so i think it's there are a number of barriers and hurdles and one that's already been mentioned as well eventually um you know we will have to look at development of new childcare provision which means trying to get new organizations off the ground or attracting organizations to deliver in merthyr tidville um and we've been quite successful at that uh, of late so i'm you know there's a little bit of me that's um confident in it but wary at the same time but the workforce is a significant issue the childcare workforce the requirements for the, the qualification profile of the staff that is quite extensive and then from the majority of them only working part-time unless it's a provision like if you like the like the Gurnos provision where it's a morning and afternoon and then it becomes a full-time job it can be quite um, challenging to attract the staff in that and there's a time period of staff getting qualified in order to be able to 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 achieve it um and I, there was there was one other that was in my mind in terms of a barrier but it's gone completely now um but you know those those are probably the significant ones oh the sorry the, the last one the challenge from welsh government is also that we have got to expand welsh language provision quite significantly um so we're looking currently at plans of how do we potentially have three welsh language preschools around every welsh primary um, as a feeder but that also has an impact in terms of existing childcare providers should parents choose to have welsh rather than english so it's a, a managing of the marketplace that's going to be thing but in the initial years potentially you could have very low take up in those childcare settings in welsh because we're going to have to convince people to go down that road um in terms of choosing welsh as a language to educate their children um and that may mean those settings might not be sustainable for a couple of years until they get the kind of numbers in that would make it a viable business proposition um we've raised that with welsh government um significant times and at the moment they got no answer to it Just in addition to that, um, absolutely, all of those that Chris have mentioned um, are some of the challenges, um, but also um, the Welsh language and the workforce together creates significant challenges. You know, we've got recruitment and retention issues in the sector at the moment where we've got people leaving the sector um, like I haven't seen before in Merthyr and I've worked here for a very long time. Um, and we've estimated that we'll need an additional approximately 100 people into the sector to meet with the um, expansion programme. Um, and as Chris says, it takes time to train those people up. But um, in addition to that, if you need somebody trained up and speaking the Welsh language, that could create um, a, a real barrier to um, developing that new provision um, until such a time where we can reach that point. OK, thanks for that. So this is coming back to scrutiny in, in January. So is that report, is that I'm picking these, going to be I'm picking these barriers further? How? Just just around the workforce alone, there is yeah. lots of activity happening. Um, you know, we've committed to developing a, a five year workforce plan, which will outline a, ro a roadmap for, you know, where we need to be and how we're going to get there. Um, but um, in the meantime, you know, there's lots of activity around um, engaging with the college, engaging with Careers Wales, working with schools um, to try and encourage people into the workforce. So, yes, there, you know, there there is this activity already happening. You know, we're not we're not standing still around any of these issues um, and we'll present some of that back to you um, in the next report. Thank you. I think I think that's just to, to focus the, the report on in January, whilst it'll it'll bring some information on those, it its focus is to look at the um, criteria that's been used to identify the LSOAs where the expansion will happen. Mm. And because, as I say, it's only going to be two to three year olds, we've got to achieve 88 uh, two to three year olds access in childcare. Um, but it's going to it's going to demonstrate which LSOAs that would be, and for for scrutiny to review that and challenge us on the the um, logic that's been put forward in terms of the selection process. Um, but also we'll look at the numbers of childcare places and the childcare requirements, the demand for those areas, and where we would be saying we we eventually may need to build new provisions so that that scrutiny will have a good oversight of what that might look like, okay. um, and um, and the sort of demand process that's going to be. Uh, going to generate out of that. Okay, thank you, Chris. Councillor Gareth Richards. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
It's uh, I run the commission in Chris. I've got a, a question just to clarify. Um, with regards to the original provider element, when are those actual numbers set and are they varied at all or are they set that were they set at the very start of a contract and they've never changed since? Sarah might be able to Sarah might be able to tell you better than me, but I'll give it a go. And um, when the original Flying Star program was established, it was based upon school clusters and data was looked at to suggest how many childcare places were needed within those cluster areas. Um, and the, the original uh, provider was set at 24 childcare places, and that's never changed because of the discussions, arguments, the take up. We've monitored take up, we've monitored unfilled spaces, and it's never been a a significant issue for us up until um, the last couple of years where the birth rate in those areas has dropped and we're seeing continual unfilled spaces, which to us obviously is money going down the drain in some respects. Um, because Merva has a, it's the same reason why you'll notice from the, the report that we've said, well, okay, we've got a cap figure of 1,287, but there's a, a falling birth rate across Merthyr, which means we've always been struggling to hit that 1,287 foot, well, I say always, for the last couple of years, which is why we've been able to expand into further areas as well and do more in outreach. Um, but that figure for that original provider has never altered. I thought that was the case, but I'm not sure. Any other questions? Any comments, please? No comments. So the recommendation of this report was for scrutiny committee to receive the report and raise questions and challenge leading to improvement. Are we happy that we've met that recommendation? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chris. OK, uh, next item. Item number six. Transition of young people leaving care. Um, and this report is on page 31 to 40. Um, I'll hand you over to Cabinet Member Julia Jenkins. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it's a um, report written by Taryn Stevens as transition of young people leaving care. Right, the purpose of this report is to provide an overview of transition for our care leavers in order to receive support from a local authority. Sorry, am I on mute? No, oh, sorry. Um, sorry, in order to receive support from a local authority as a care leaver, the young person must have been looked after by local authority for the prescribed period of time within a prescribed age range, Regulation 47 of Care Planning, Placement and Case Reviews Wales Regulations 2015. Currently set the criteria the requirement to be looked after by a local authority for a period of 13 weeks prior to the age of 14 and 16 years. The overall duty is to, is to promote well-being and specific responsibilities towards care leavers, including preparing a pathway assessment and plan for the age of 16, which should build on the young person's care and support plan and include support for preparation for adulthood and independence. Appointing a personal advisor to keep in touch, offer support and advice, coordinate services and to participate in implementing and reviewing the pathway plan. Safeguarding and promoting their well-being by making sure they have enough money to live on, have a suitable place to live and supported, including financially in relation to education, training or employment. The report shared with committee members provides an overview of the legislative context of our work where we previously were, where we are now, and our future ambition for young people. I'll hand you over to Taryn now to provide you with further details in regards to where we are now. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Jenkins. Scrutiny will note some replication between the earlier reports. That's because they both fall under the same action plan for children's services, but this report provides some more detail in yes, young people are clearly first. So we've continued to build upon the ethos of early transition planning for our looked after young people. We have focused on co-producing our services with young people to ensure that we promote transitions into adulthood. To offer our young people the same opportunities it would be possible for any young person to expect. We continue to reflect on our structure and delivery of services 
about early preparation and planning for independence. Considerable work has been undertaken to further develop the model for the area of Hodor, children looked after and young people who believe us. And I know as part of scrutiny stage part of the earlier report, we have a number of those here. It's important to note when I'm ready provisions for young people who have been in the foster care provision that stay within that provision then pass their 18th birthday on our adulthood. We've shared that we developed a transition panel and that in 2021 the transition panel uh, policy was ratified by Council. Before we, in, as part of our plans in 2022 to 2023, we will be undertaking an internal review of that transition policy to reflect upon the implementation of that policy and next steps for us as a local authority. Local authorities offer to our young people to support their transition in adulthood is described throughout the report. Our care experience young people have supported and continue to support our insight into what good care and accommodation looks like for them. And as described earlier, they've supported with the development of the site at the Neighbourhood Learning Centre and also part of our corporate parenting board and form part of our models of care steering group for any future residential or foster care provisions that the local authority take forward. As previously described, we've spoken about our pathway to work and work opportunities for young people in our care or care leavers. And there's some narrative around the different opportunities that there are for our care leavers. In the first two quarters of this year, the pathway to work has supported 11 young people into education, training and employment opportunities. Referral has been made. Three young people are accessing placements within the local authority and a fourth one due to start. Further 12 young people are receiving intensive packages of and training to prepare them for sustainable education, training or employment. It's important to note that a number of young people who are accessing these provisions have struggled historically to engage in training and employment. We have some young people who have, have engaged in pro-criminal behaviour who are now employed and have future aspirations to continue in that way. The, innovation, the innovative scheme Seven for Dodsville has been come across in the last year. That pilot was discussed earlier. We currently have six care experienced young people who are accessing that support. And as we shared, that will now be expanded further. During the past few years, the LACES team has been central to the development of the innovative Clark Friendly School project. And the CONTAF project now comprises of three elements. Clark Friendly Schools Handbook, which is a three tiered training program and Clark Friendly School Quality Mark Framework. As a service, we are incredibly proud that this project is now nationally recognised with the Welsh Government using the resource as their basis for their online looked after children in education resource across Wales. You know, and as part of point seven, we take you through the key next steps for us in terms of support for the transition of young people leaving care. Thank you, Tari. Um, I just got a few questions, so that's okay. Um, so I've had a look at the local authority, local authority's website um, in relation to what information is available for key, care leavers. Now, the only thing I could find on there was a report, like a um, it was a young people leaving care booklet, but that was dated March two thousand and eighteen. But I think you've got such good examples of the work that's being done with care leavers, I think perhaps maybe that could be looked at. Because um, I just went on the website, like, you know, just to try and find anything really to signpost me. Um, but yeah, it just maybe that could be looked at, if that's okay. Yeah, I think that's some really interesting feedback. It's something that we've been working on over the last 18 months. We've developed a series, because what we want to make sure is, is that uh, that information is really accessible to our young people. So we've developed alongside young people a number of animations that will allow them to understand how they can access support and services, but definitely an area of improvement that we're looking into. Lovely, thank you for that, Erin. Um, I think I had one more. Oh yeah, just in relation to um, enough money to live on and supported financially in relation to education, training or employment. I'm guessing that's like a varied amount. Does it depend on the circumstances if they're engaged in education? or Does that... Very. What we found with a number of our young people is, is when they enter employment, 
that employment may not cover the provision that they currently reside in. So as corporate parents, we look to support them to make sure that they see value in employment and they're supported and they can meet their basic needs. And what we would expect for our own children is we would support them as corporate parents. That can be something anecdotal in terms of if they need one-off support to purchase items or for gas and electricity, or that can be something that we may commit to a standard payment throughout their training and then employment until they move to the next phase where they can be financially sufficient. Lovely, thank you for that, Taryn. Uh, Claire Jones, Councillor Claire Jones. Um, going on from that one, Taryn, um, obviously the government brought in a pilot scheme this year. How many of our young people were successful in going on the pilot scheme for the £1,600, which would help them transition into the next level? So throughout the course of the year, there were 11 young people who would be able to access that pilot scheme. And we currently have four that have turned 18 within that window and now accessing that pilot. What I would say is I think it's really ambitious and it's really, really positive that our young people are being supported to have a real living wage to help them move forward. For our young people, though, some of that needs to be met with an element of caution. And we've done lots of front loaded work with our young people around building up their finances prior to their 18th birthday. So they don't go from very limited income to very significant income, which could be a risk in terms of exploitation. We've also done work with some of our young people who have some difficulties and are currently accessing support around potentially gambling, alcohol use substance misuse to make sure actually that having that money doesn't create an additional risk for them but what I would say is positively our young people are really on board with working with us in a way that makes that pilot very safe for them. Yeah. Um, thank you. Also um, have you struggled with the accommodation for the, for the individuals leaving care? I think it's, it's fair to say that there is a lack of sufficiency mm. for individuals who are leaving care and wish to live independently or in supported accommodation. I think the local authority has been very ambitious over the last three years about a number of developments. So we've had Hillfort, we've got Garth Newers, there's yeah. a development at the NLC, a potential residential project that we're looking at looks at kind of a test of flat provision that would help people transfer to residential to um, supported accommodation, but there definitely is a lack of availability, one bedroom housing for our care experience young people. Thank you. Um, 3.7, in order to receive support from the local authority as a care leaver, the young person must have been looked after by a local authority for, for a prescribed period of time within the prescribed age range. Can you just explain that to me, please? Because I feel, I feel a bit lost in that point of 3.7. So some young people who may have been a care experienced young person may have come into care for a very short period of time. Um, so there may have been some very specific family difficulties, which may, which may mean that they would have only been accommodated for a weekend okay. and they may have returned mm -hmm. back to their family home. So they then wouldn't have full eligibility for care leaving support because of that very small window of time. Thank you. Sorry, I got quite a few. Um, if a young person is in a residential provision, this is going to 3.8, if a young person is in a res residential provision, um, would they be placed on an independent living plan and have access to the 16 plus worker while still in the residential? So when a young person is 15 and three quarters, a pathway plan is developed and they have access to um, a young person's advisor that starts at that juncture and that's to support that transition into adulthood because those support networks will last until they are 25. If a young person is within residential, that applies and is the same. What we have proactively done as a local authority, though, in terms of managing risk, is that we are looking to step young people out of residential sooner so that we can support their risk management when they're in the community so that they don't turn 18 and then they don't have the support networks that they may have had prior to being 18. I actually welcome that. Sorry, um, going on to 4.5, I'd like to say that I welcome this and well done. That was just my point on that one. And I think I'll just go one. No, I've got two. Sorry. Um, I'm going to 5.3. The one thing I do worry about is when a young person is rehoused, being such a young age, the one thing I do worry about is cocoin. So what, oh, bless you, what do we sort of, are we educating the young person to identify whether they are being cocooed or, you know, are we, have we got 
individuals because how the housing first they are available so they would go in and they would look at the property but if the young person is not under housing first and they've got a, a property of their own how are we identifying the potential cocoin that could be going on so there are very small numbers of care experienced people that exit foster care um, or residential that go straight into an independent living provision. Most of those exits are around the being in supported accommodation. We have a, a contract that supports outreach provision so that when young people do then move into independence, there is an outreach programme of work that goes with them throughout that period of time. So whilst that wouldn't be 24 hour support, like it may be in some supported accommodation provisions, it is very much enhanced. When you consider that alongside them having a young person's advisor as well and any transition planning into hard or hard, that supports, I suppose, the robustness in the plan moving forward. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you. And I got one last thing. Sorry. Um, your corporate parenting board. I'm quite interested in having further information about that, if that would be possible. Of course. That's lovely. Thank you. Sorry, Chair. <laughs> It's absolutely fine, Mauricio. Apologise. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, please? No. Councillor Gareth Richards. With regards to uh, paragraph four five, the, uh, the apprenticeships and the various um, uh, things that will be put in place, obviously there must. Is there more demand than there are places available, and how are people then selected to be the chosen people to want those? So there is a steering group that's set up for the pathway to work that looks at all young people who would be eligible. So they are um, looked after young people to access that support. What we look at is what provision they're engaging with at that time, because actually there are lots of our young people who are care experienced that are really successful in education and they go on to university that don't need the intensity of support that some other young people do. But we consider all those young people so we know that the right young people are getting through for that support. What I would say is the pathway to work started off as a pilot and due to its success, we were very fortunate that the local authority agreed that that would come into part of our core functioning as children's services. What we have recommended is that there is a further expansion and opportunities that is currently being considered, but within the current climate, obviously, that will be mm. about discussing how we may progress that forward. Yeah. Just one other question, Chair, if that's okay. Um, how many can be accommodated in the, in the new uh, facility at the Gouros? Five young people. Answer Ian Thomas. Uh, further question on the apprentice scheme. <clears throat> uh, what are the terms and conditions like? Do they get a living wage for going on that scheme? And are there any possibilities that it could develop into a job with the authority? So in terms of the payments, that's done in line with what we would pay as a standard for traineeships. What we found with our young people is a number of them went on traineeships but needed an additional level of support. So we've developed something that sits just underneath that currently. So they are paid in line with what we would expect a trainee to be paid. The young people who are currently within the local authority actually are doing phenomenally well and the skill bases that they are building, I feel very confident will set them up for any future applications that they may want to make within the local authority. Thank you. Thank you. Last, last one for me. Sorry, I forgot this one. Um, when you the, you know the transition panel and you're going to do the review, um, it says 22-23 internal review. Is that going to come to scrutiny then? Is that information that we'd be able to have, please? Happy to bring that as a specific update or as part of us doing our next update for our transition of young people leaving care. Lovely. Thank you for that. Any comments? I have a comment. Um, how do I say this? Obviously, I, I work in child services um, and I don't work in this area at all, but I have been to another authority in England where they have celebrated children in care. So it's been, everyone's come together for an award night. Mm -hmm. And and I think that would be really positive that 
that we should think about doing something like that in Merthyr because if we've got so many people that they were are proud of, I think we should celebrate them. And I think I think it gives the opportunity then for it to be a knock on effect. You know, somebody's doing good and somebody may be attending who's not doing good and they just need that bit of mentorship. And they can see, wow, look at that person. They've gone on to university or they've gone on to get the job. So I would I would welcome um, Mertha as a council to hold an event for children looked after where we can celebrate their achievements, albeit whether they just go into school, you know, or they've just done, they attend a karate class or whatever, because everyone has got an achievement. Even if even if they're naughty, they've still got that some form of achievement. So I would actually welcome that as an authority if we could do something like that, and I'd love to attend. Any other comments? Sort of a war night. Yeah, I remember going back when I was mayor before. The, I think we did have some sort of award night. It may not have been called an award night, but we used to have gatherings with everyone. Successful. We had yeah. twins who were successful getting Olympic medals, and you know they were invited to the mayor's parlour. So we have done some achievement events. Yeah. Prior to COVID, there was a standard annual celebration event, and that's due to take place at the start of next year. Um, for our um, cake spirits young people. We also hold annual events just to allow them to all come together as a group actually. So there'll be a mm. Christmas event for them when we do one at Easter and such as well. Lovely. Thank you. Um, and again, thanks for that. Again, this good evidence, you know, the, the listening of the voices and the collaboration with those care experienced uh, people. So yeah, thank you. Um, lovely. So the recommendation for this report was a uh, scrutiny committee to ask uh, asked to receive the report and raise questions and challenge leading to improvement are we happy we've met that recommendation yeah thank you okay oh that's council Gareth richards have raised in the report forward plan forward um program work program <laughs> oh i don't know I think yeah. you're overdue for a budget report. Okay. I'm looking at the director. Um, perhaps, you know, not in detail, but perhaps bring it forward to the next, uh, as an outline to the next meeting. That's the question. Yeah. Do you want it in the similar format that we did last time, looking at the sort of the variations or anything specific? Yeah. Well, what we've done previously um, is sufficiently so, yeah. Is that enough time for next scrutiny, January? Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, item number seven, scrutiny referrals. So I haven't had any, anybody got anything that they wanted to to bring up? But also, again, just a reminder as elected members, if there's any common themes or any issues that we think that we need to um, look at as a committee and add value, just just uh, just bring them forward. Um, at this point, officers, if you wanted to leave, that's fine. Go have a cup of tea. Thank you very much. Lisa, do you want to, sorry, Louise, do you want to stay or do you want to go? It's up to you, Julia, but it's OK. You can leave if you want to. OK, thanks very much. I'm sorry I couldn't make earlier. I can't I can't walk. No, it's OK. <laughs> you take care. Look after yourself. OK, thanks. Bye. 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 Oh, she can't hear me. She's great. OK, so item eight, uh, report recommendations. I know we've done this as we went through each item. Um, I, th I feel that we were happy in 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 meeting the recommendations of each report. I think we had some good questions there. I don't know if MD wanted to add anything. No. OK, and then feedback on scrutiny activities. Agenda item nine. So we had our joint one today and I thought that went really well. 
um, those in attendance. I, I don't know how you thought that went. Think today. Yeah. 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 No, I I thought it was good. We we had one last week, week before. Yeah. 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 So, um, and I think obviously if we can just build in the visit, um, to to the Gurness Neighbourhood Centre, that'd be a good one. Um, and obviously I don't think there's any outstanding actions or any other proposed um scrutiny activities, is there? As far as I'm aware, nope. And then item now in any other business deemed urgent by the chair, I have none. Um, and that's it. So our next meeting is the 10th of January. So Merry Christmas. Merry happy, Christmas. happy new year. <laughs> See you in 2023. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Take care.